Welcome, I'm Brandon Cho, and I'm head of learning and engagement here at the Zimmerling Art Museum. And I'm really excited to welcome you tonight for this exciting conversation with D.D. William, Erica James, and uh, Pat Gardner. Uh, this event is presented in connection with the exhibition at the Zimmerling right now, downstairs, called Repossession, D.D. William and Paul Gardner, which is currently on view in the Volpe Gallery until July 31st, so please check it out if you haven't already. Um, it's really incredible. So as we learned tonight um, through this discussion, this exhibition seeks to reevaluate our understanding of the narratives of Western history and art through how William and Gardere confront the long and ongoing history of colonialism and emphatically forge their own identities and create powerful narratives of resistance. So before I turn it over to our esteemed speakers, I need to just introduce them. Um, first, PDA William, originally from Port-au-Prince, Haiti. He earned a BFA in painting from the Maryland Institute of College of Art and an MFA in painting printmaking from Yale University School of Art. His work has been exhibited at numerous museums, including the Museum of Contemporary Art in North Miami, the Bronx Museum of Art, the Museum of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, the Carnegie Museum, the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. He is represented by James Fuentes Gallery in New York, Alton and Siegel Gallery in San Francisco, and Gallery Peter Fleischmann in Zurich, Switzerland. William has received numerous awards and was a 2018 recipient from the Rosenthal Family Foundation Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a 22 recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grants, and a 2001 recipient of a Q Fellowship from the Q Center for Arts and Heritage, and a 2003 recipient of the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Biennial Grant. He has taught at several institutions, including the Yale School of Art, Vassar College, Columbia University, UPenn, and SUNY Purchase. He is currently an assistant professor of expanded Penn and Mason Gross School of Arts here at Rutgers University. Next is Catherine Cat Gardner, the director of the estate of Paul Gardner, who operates publicly at the Paul Gardner Studio in Brooklyn, New York. Born in Puerto Prince, Haiti, and raised in Brooklyn, she's a graduate of Brown University. In addition to her role as the estate director, a seasoned multimedia creative producer. Over a 20-year career, she has collaborated with numerous prominent artists, photographers, and directors to produce exhibitions around the world, art books, shoots, and more nominated films and television series. And director, I'm mean, sorry, Dr. Erica Moya James, who will moderate tonight's dis discussion, contributed the erudite and beautifully um, composed gallery text for the exhibition. Is also an art historian, curator, and assistant professor at the University of Miami. Dr. James earned a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Chicago, a doctorate degree, doctor degree in art history from Duke University, and she was the founding cur curator and director of the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. She previously taught at Yale University as well. Her research centers on indigenous, modern, and contemporary art of the Caribbean, Americas, and the African diaspora. Dr. James is currently the, Clo the Clark Oakley Humanities Fellow at the Clark Art Institute, where she plans to develop several chapters for her next book, which focuses on 18th and 19th century global Caribbean art in conversation with different practices and art historical methodologies. As an extension of this book project, she will also develop an ex exhibition of some of the earliest known paintings in France the Caribbean made by British military artists. I also want to recognize Zim Zimmerle's own Nicole Simpson, Associate Curator of Prints and Drawings, who helped coordinate this exhibition, and Claire D'Amato, Assistant Curator of Education, who has provided valuable support to bring this night together. Um, the conversation will last around 40 minutes, and there will be time for Q&A, so please keep your questions ready. Um, and I invite you to a reception afterward in the lobby until 6 p.m. Um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to our speakers. Please help me uh, welcome them today. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation, Nicole and Mr. Brandon, for just making this possible, this conversation possible. Thank you to Kat and Didier for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, it has been a pleasure, as always, to work with you both. Um, I just want to start by saying that I think of Paul uh, Gardier and Didier William as a global Caribbean artist. And I'm always asked to explain what I mean by Caribbean. Um, but for me, that merely means that I think that they and their work occupy multiple discourses simultaneously. They're engaged with the world from a Caribbean perspective. I think um, their story 
uh, connects with the Caribbean, but it's also an American story. It is also about modern contemporary art practices and thinking. It is also a human story. And as such, the create work that exists in our critical moment, this moment that we live in right now. And I find that this coming together, how many of you have seen the show downstairs? So a few of you. Uh, I, this, you know, sometimes we may think, oh, they're both Haitian artists, this is a nice thing to, you know, to do, but it may seem a little bit forced, that sort of coming together. But I think if you go downstairs, you realize that there are really interesting synergies between the work of Paul Nader and um, Didier William. And it's those synergies that I want us to focus on today um, in this conversation. I think by bringing their art together, um, the, exhi the exhibition really shows um, the breadth, the real breadth of, of the, these practices and the whole notion of global uh, Caribbean art histories and the notion of diaspora itself for what it allows us to see in this contemporary moment and what it allow, how it allows us to, in a sense, move beyond the sort of tried and true boundaries of Western art histories, to really think about new configurations, new methodologies of looking, but also, but also making. And with that, um, a little bit of my sermon is over. <laughs> and I want us to start with Kat because um, your father is not here to represent himself, and you're in a really interesting <coughs> position as someone who represents their parent, who was this incredible artist, and you are his spokesperson um, to us today. So um, he's from a different generation from Didier. So I want you to talk a little bit about your father's practice, ground us a bit in his practice. And um, like Didier, like yourself, like me, we are all immigrants. Uh, we all came to the United States from somewhere else. But as an artist, um, talk a little bit, if you can, about um, Paul's shift, uh, moving from Haiti. He moved back and forth, I know. But did movement, in a sense, also reflect in his practice, practice and in terms of changing changes in themes, approaches, materials, etc.? Ground us a bit. Thank you, Erica, um, and thank everyone at Zimbabwe for having us. Um, yes, yeah, so Paul's um, Paul was born in Haiti, um, of course, and uh, stayed there until he was 14, um, and ultimately was brought to New York by his mother, um, who came here two years prior um, and sent for her sons um, when Paul was 14 and his younger brother was 12. Um, at the time, he didn't have an art practice as a child. Um, it was here in the United States, in New York, that he discovered his love of art. Um, and he, you know, displaced as a child, experienced terrible culture shock, uh, terrible homesickness, um, and it was through um, admiring visual art and being exposed actually to Western art first um, that he really felt um, and fell in love with um, a kind of visual medium and felt um, and, and had emotional experiences um, and started to explore um, and, and become trained in um, this practice. So he uh, started to study at the Art Students League, encouraged by his mother, who um, herself had had uh, artistic training in Haiti, um, studied with uh, Charles Alston, um, and uh, who himself was a teacher of Jake Florence, um, and then went on to be uh, trained at Cooper Union, uh, where he got his bachelor's, and then did his master's at Hunter. So his initial, uh, you know, unlike, unlike many Haitian artists, he, his first training was formal training in Western arts. Um, it was only until, it wasn't until he returned to Haiti 19 years after his immigration to the United States where he felt that he discovered his true purpose as an artist. And it was then that he really brought in um, the Haitian themes um, and felt that he really, like I said, discovered 
um, his his purpose to marry the Haitian and American slash Western um, kind of traditions. So uh, for Paul, truly the the central theme of his life's work is the blending of the two um, forces, the two cultural forces that shaped his entire life. Um, there kind of is no, uh, there is no real understanding of his work without understanding um, that, that he felt, that he straddled these cultures. Um, he was displaced and, and at a very, very pivotal time in his life. Um, and ultimately did, over the course of time, go back and forth between these two places. Um, ultimately, you know, was naturalized as an American citizen finally in 1991, um, and I think in the end identified probably more as an American because he spent the majority of his life in this country, but never lost um, the feeling of kinship and, and um, longing for home that originated with Haitian homeland and his Haitian life. Um, and indeed, the entirety of his work um, deals with seeing the world through the lens of Haitian culture and Haitian themes. And Didier, when did you become aware of Paul's um, work? And upon engaging it, what struck you? What What did you see first? Thanks. Thank you, Erica. And Kat, I love how you spoke about Paul and his work. And I think um, the overlaps and intersections between my practice and Paul's practice, for me, the, the relevance there and the potency there is actually less about the fact that both of us originated from the same country. That's the least interesting part for me. The most interesting part is that I recognized an artist who, as you eloquently said, Kat, was thinking about belonging and was thinking about home and was thinking about movement using the language of print and graphic media using print as evidence, print as facsimile, print as residual, um, all of the sort of connotative devices that are also analogous to the process of immigration and moving to another place that is not your place of origin. Um, and that's the thing that when I first experienced Paul's work, I was like, wow, this is an artist um, who's thinking about these things in the same uh, kind of layered, stratified perspective that I've been thinking about that really resonates with me. And actually, in preparation for this talk, we were all exchanging emails and stuff back and forth, and Kat was like, well, Paul, Paul wasn't so much of a printmaker, um, so we have to, <laughs> and you know, I, I thought to myself, like, I think about print more than I think about, you know, master printer. Um, my students who are in the audience can tell you, I, care very little well about becoming a master printer. <laughs> um, and more, I, I think I care about the most is like how, how is an artist processing print and the effects of printmaking and the potency of printmaking um, within their conceptual and material devices. And that's what I acknowledged and took noticed in Paul's work when I was in, uh, introduced to his work. I think it was probably close to 10 years ago now. Um, and, and it made sense for me because that kind of layering, that kind of stratification was not only um, kind of uh, palatable and curious to me as a, as a maker and as an artist, but it also seemed to beautifully analogize my own process of moving and my, my family's process of moving to this country, um, figuring out new relationships to the land, to the people, to the culture, and trying to find the signs and symbols and codes that gave meaning to all of those things. Um, which I think is, you know, in this case, talking about me and Paul, and both of us are Asian artists, but that's also, that's, that's a quintessentially American story, right? Um, uh, almost regardless of where you're from, that, that process of um, resituating home. Um, I love seeing the kind of, um, uh, plants and, and foliage ephemera in Paul's work because in, in Miami and South Florida, one of the things many immigrants do is plant 
and replant things as soon as they arrive and repopulate the geography to look like what they left back home. Um, and I know when I'm working on my own work and, and thinking about the landscape and ground, that's one of the things that sort of sticks out for me. And I love seeing those same kind of layered perspectives in Paul's work. And so, you know, to answer the question, Erica, I think it, it wasn't even a specific work or even the, the fact that, like, this was an Asian art. I, I, of course, love the fact that Paul is um, getting his right to do within the canon, but it was his process and his way of approaching content um, and, uh, and allowing print to sort of do that structural work that print can, can do uniquely um, that resonated with me the most. It's always funny when I plan for these events how I wanted to go like this, and the moment we start talking, it goes off. Like, we're like six questions in a row. Okay. Um, but I want to sort of go back to something Kat said, and also return to what you were saying in a way. I want to talk a little bit about what we think Western art is now. Whether, you know, we talk about Haitian art as in relation to the West, as if it's a kind of monument or some sort of starting line that we all have to address. Um, and we talk about different sort of designations for artists, American artists, Caribbean artists, Haitian artists, etc. And for me, it's always about the work. But we still have to look, sort of think through the notion of the West. For both of you, and maybe for you as a practicing artist, and for you as an artist, or you're working on history, um, Kat, is Western art a historical fact or thing that we have to deal with? Or in our contemporary moment, is it something that we reference? Or, or do artists like Didier like Paul put pressure on those sort of, that sort of monumentality of that designation in their modern contemporary practices to sort of imagine something else or we need what that means. Actually, um, I mean, it's a, it is a tough question. We overuse, we often refer to Western art, Western art, right? But I do think it's important that we keep calling it out. Um, much, it's the paradigm that we live in, right? Much in, not to get too contentious here, but much in the same way, right, that we are now often talking about whiteness. Um, it is the default. Right, um, it, it long has been um, for the art world. It you know when we when you open up an art history textbook, you open up Jansen, you know it is um, the default for art history as we know it, or as we have always known it, and it doesn't need to be. And yet, uh, when you when one. Um, typically, historically, <laughs> goes to be trained in, you know, formal art technique, um, formal, you know, art historical training, that tends to be, that does tend to be the starting line. Um, you know, and so for Paul, right, uh, regardless of what his background was, you know, as a, as a student interested in learning aesthetic technique, right, um, he, you know, uh, that is what he, in America, that is where he was, what's what he was schooled in. Um, he had to go, he had to take it upon himself and teach himself his own history, go back to his own homeland and study his own lineage. There's a, a wonderful and very, very rich history um, of Haitian, master painters, um, those aren't found in history books, right? He had to go and teach himself. So in many ways, as, as much as he was a formally trained painter, he had to self-teach himself his own his history, cultural history um, for painting. So 
you know, I do think that, that Western art needs to be referenced um, in the context of what it leaves out, <laughs> you know, and that is the art of the global south, right? Um, and that is, there is so much, and we're lucky in that it's a limited time that is increasing in visibility, um, but I almost forgot where I was initially going with this, <laughs> this question. <laughs> um, but, you know, it doesn't, it no longer needs to be, uh, it no longer needs to be default. That being said, it is also, an there's an incredible history in there and incredible art, um, as downstairs will attest. <laughs> the European art room is just full of rich tradition and incredible, incredible things in San Frank. I, I can't say of any other thing. I just said it. I mean, I think I think Western art is thievery, masquerading as mastery. Um, I think That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Rolf Trio, um, an anthropologist, brilliant anthropologist who has since passed, um, taught us that history is not um, a, a chronological sequence, uh, a neat and tidy chronological sequence. It's actually a well calibrated series of silences um, and I think that the task and project of those of us who are makers, producers, writers, artists, um, as Trio describes it, is to fill those gaps um, with our stories that have been left out, explicitly and specifically left out, in order to shape this sort of idealistic conception of quote unquote mastery which aligns with notions of whiteness as Kat um, brilliantly described. Um, and, and of course then it becomes our task to not only reinsert ourselves into the narrative, but to also correct the narrative and bring forth people like Paul and people like Don Pisano and people like Wendy Johnson and people like, and so on and so on and so on. All of those have been left out of the canon of mastery that shapes what is considered to be quote unquote Western art. Um, I think, I think that, that really in and of itself is the project. And, not that I'm biased, but I think printmaking is really well equipped to do that work because built within the structure is a scaffolding for layering histories, right? That doesn't allow you to separate process from content. That forces you to sort of handcuff those two elements of critical practice uh, uh, together so that the viewer cannot bifurcate your content from your process. And in so doing, connect those two ideas uh, continually as they, as they sort of sit with the work of art in real time. Um, so I have like three questions now. <laughs> One will be about home, and I'm going to get back to that, the idea of home. But talking about, one will be, and I'm just telling you the best, I, because Didier thinks of Paul in printmaking, and you're like, no Didier, Paul was not a printmaker. I want us to talk a little bit about process and materials and how he saw himself, uh, and perhaps painting with materials. Uh, but Didier, I want you to first start by extending your comments to, I want us to think about this painting and these, and these prints. These two, this is one of my favorite um, works by you and prints by you. And talk about painting and printmaking as literal processes and the work you think they do independently. What, why this is a painting and not a print, and why this is a print, and in relation to other paintings you've made on the subject. I'm asking all my hard questions. <laughs> um. And so, that's a great question, Erga. Uh, thank you. And I think in order to answer that question, I have to connect it back to your point about home, which I think functions in both of these works. Um, I think home is a, a kind of fulcrum in both of these works, just as much as printmaking is. Um, and to the first question, this is a, a painting and not a print because it disobeys the principal rule of the print and that there, the matrix is also the discrete object. Um, the discrete object that we consider to be a painting is also the fundamentally the woodblock that would be printed. 
Um, for those who haven't seen the work in person, the um, eyes that are carved into the figure, um, uh, the eyes are cut right into the surface of the, of, of the figure. And so theoretically you could take that paint, uh, panel, panel. Theoretically you could take the, the uh, panel and ink it up and print it much like you would a relief block in, in the shop. Um, and, and as such, it then becomes a relief block, right? But one of the things I would, even when I was in graduate school and I started combining painting and print processes, one of the things I became immediately interested in was not just the kind of polyvedial and interdisciplinary capacity of painting and printmaking to do interesting things, but to conceptually complicate uh, what we consider to be the discretion of a painting with the um, uh, potential for a print matrix to repeat itself. Um, that's, that's the purpose of trying to get the matrix to be as stable as possible so that one could produce an addition of 20, 30, 40 um, identical images that then become the addition uh, produced from that plate. Um, I wanted the kind of speculative potential of that to collapse with the singular discretion of the painting and, and as such create a tertiary object that we would then have to find new meaning and new language for. Um, whereas this, sorry, this piece is a, by definition a, a very sort of traditional print. It's a four plate uh, litho printed by um, Harlan Weaver Press in um, New York, Felix Harlan um, and his uh, since past wife, Carol Weaver, started a brilliant press in, in uh, Lower East Side. And they approached me and wanted to do a project together. Uh, and so this is a combination of four different uh, copper plates that have been treated in various ways to produce this stratified landscape um, that's part of a cursed ground series uh, that I was working on and, and still kind of working on. Um, and so that's the sort of print connection between the two of them. And that, in my mind, that's what demarcates them as objects. That's what sort of signals one as a definitive print and one as a definitive painting, but this painting um, models itself for the composition for it comes from the house that, the first house that we moved into when my family and I moved to the United States uh, after I'd gotten hit by a car. Um, and I intentionally didn't pull up photographs of the house and just try to remember what it was like sitting on this couch uh, with a big lump on the back of my head um, after having been struck by um, a car that my dad witnessed. Um, and a lot of the architecture of the home, the sort of uh, walls and even the space outside is relief block print. So the space outside is a print of a mango leaf. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of us in Miami will have lots of things planted in our yards, mango, avocado, papaya, sugar cane. Um, uh, it's really delicious. Um, and, and so I wanted that material to be, to sort of really shape the architecture um, of, of the house around me. And this piece, as I mentioned, is from the Curse of Ground series, and it, it started right at the beginning of the pandemic when right after my husband and I had, had our daughter, and we were homebound like the rest of the world and couldn't really go anywhere except we now had um, a newborn baby and we needed to get out of the house. And so we would take these walks to uh, Lorimer, which is like this big green space in PA where we live, um, and started to really rediscover the landscape in, in really brilliant ways. And so I've, I've started to work with a lot of the images and photographs I took from that time and in, in both of these pieces, home is situated as something very, very different. And, I, and I'll say that before we had our daughter, I didn't, in, in how I conceptualized home, I didn't really consider the ground here. I always considered this sort of imagined ground, yeah. um, this kind of ethereal space, this lifted space that was absent of gravity, specifically and deliberately absent of gravity, that shaped a kind of um, imaginative diasporic conception in AD that's where home was located and it wasn't until after we had our kids that I started to think about and associate and identify with the kind of geography and terrain of this space as also a kind of second area to share you um, And again, I think trying to think through the symbols, signs, and icons that give way to both of those different conceptions of home produce print ephemera in, in my work and sometimes that turns into 
prints into prints like this one, and then other times it turns into painting or the other the other work. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kat, can you talk about your pushback against the DA in terms of printmaking, but also um, Paul's um, engagement with the idea of having I don't know if you want to show, maybe you could talk directly to a workflow. I don't want to work. Well, with regards to the pushback, I suppose, with regards to printmaking, um, I think actually that, that clarification came truly probably from my unfamiliarity really, with uh, printmaking as a discipline. Um, Paul really wasn't um, a, it wasn't really his medium of choice. He, at one point, I think, in, to my knowledge, may have experimented with multiple, um, he did, over the course of his career, you know, experiment with different techniques, um, but in general, he was an artist who, who made unique work of art, um, you know, his, uh, later in his career, he actually did do unique works of art where he did carve, uh, wood, um, much like you might make, um, like what he like did. Really exactly. Um, see, I don't even know the terminology. <laughs> but, um, so to me, when, when one speaks about printmaking, I felt the need to say, well, no, we didn't even make prints, right? But, um, I think where, what I'm hearing today say is that there is a conceptual uh, purpose, right, to printmaking and utilization of the concept, right, that that sort of went over my head. <laughs> uh, and that's that's totally fine. Um, with regards to kind of material uh, and the way that he used material, though, um, in this particular work that you pulled up here, um, the soil actually functions in a really interesting way and actually does originate a lot with the concept of home. Um, it's not utilized in this particular piece in that way, but um, Paul in the late 80s actually, um, he wrote ultimately that that's really when soil kind of entered his, his work um, and it sparked uh, an entire series of mud works, as I call them. Um, soil actually entered his work through, uh, I think the quote, through something like a powerful nostalgia for place. Um, it really, he, uh, we left, the family left Haiti in 1984 um, after this incredible period of uh, and, and prolific artistic output um, and somewhat classic exile uh, from the Duvalier, second Duvalier regime. And um, while we were, you know, back in, in, in Brooklyn and, and settled, um, he also felt a, a terrible longing um, and turned actually to soil in a very conceptual way uh, to be connected to land um, and to be connected to earth and um, in this way uh, started to work with this material in a very lofty and conceptual way um, in, as a sort of sacred substance, um, not invoking it at all in a lowly, dirty way, but truly um, tapping it as a, as a symbol of Earth as power, Earth as one of the sacred elements, um, particularly in the lens of how it might be revered um, in a, say, voodoo ceremony or um, for its kind of potency as um, in, in a spiritual, through a spiritual lens. Um, and so uh, this is uh, work to gardens. It is downstairs in the show. Um, and this figure is nearly life-size, and it is a relief um, that has been sculpted out of the surface of the uh, surface of the work, um, and it makes its soil and earth and uh, sticks um, that have been mixed with an acrylic 
fluid medium um, to allow it to be sculptable um, and quite stable. And so uh, in doing that, he is really creating a, a human figure that to him is uh, a representation of something that's very sacred. Um, and in this work, it is a representation of, of something that is not only um, just a person of, of the earth, um, he's also juxtaposing it against um, a, a recreation, a copy of uh, a Monet painting, Lady in the Garden, right? So this is a, a contrast of um, two representations of the land, um, you know, and of labor versus leisure. So, um, you know, this, again, is how Paul would sort of contrast this sort of Getting into my next question. Oh, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is sort of how Paul would kind of begin with something highly personal, you know, and highly, um, you know, highly, highly intimate, right? But then kind of go into these sort of conceptual and um, cultural, historical, um, you know, juxtapositions and sort of have the work will simultaneously be intimate and personal and, and yet also uh, global and, and timeless in a way. I want us all to remember that because I, I think um, that's a really important point. Uh, the way he's building content by these historical relationships is almost canonical works, right? Um, and right now, in terms of contemporary art, we know that there are tons of African American, African diasporic artists um, working with the canon. You know, um, uh, Kehinde Wiley, uh, Nicolou Thomas, Ayola Rizku, every, you know, they have, yeah, Kaibis Kafar, very much doing work um, directly, uh, in, within a direct and purposeful conversation with um, quote unquote Western art and Western canon. But what I, I find interesting in both of your work, there, there is a reference on occasion, but it's not nearly as direct or obvious, but it's there. And maybe since Kat has started this conversation about the ways in which Paul is doing that in this work in particular, this is a fascinating painting by the way. Really, it, it, it's, it's the layers of it is quite, um, yeah, quite, quite beautiful. But I want you to probably talk about the ways that you also do this. And since the shovel is right here, also talk a little bit about the shovel as a kind of icon um, and a, a, a bearer of content in the context of Caribbean mass, maybe, and even migration. You may think of the machete as a, another kind of symbol, but this is there as well. Yeah, maybe I'll start with the shovel um, because I resonate with that uh, intently. I have very vivid memories of my dad um, using the same, and I think it's still in our house to this day, using the same shovel um, to dig, to plant grass, to plant a lot of those papaya and avocado and um, mango trees that are now you know, 10, 20 feet tall in our yard. And I think in many ways it's an opportunity to reclaim the land and to um, stake ownership over this new space that um, through circumstance is now home, right? Like this, this space that we don't have an ancestral relationship with, but we have an adopted relationship with is now home. And so part of that impulse is to sort of claim ownership of the land. And I very quickly identified the shovel as the sort of extension of my, my parents' labor um, through which they could do that work. And so it showed up in a, a few pieces of mine, none that are in the show, um, as a symbol of the kind of continual work of the Asian Revolution as a symbol of labor, as an extension of the body. Um, and I love, I love the point that you made, Eric, about labor and its association to a kind of cultural iconography, particularly within immigrant populations. And then to the, to the question about um, uh, art historical citation, I, the piece that comes to mind for me is the work that I made I forget the year, I think it might have been 2018 or, or 2017, um, uh, that was a artist's copy of uh, Jacques-Louis David's Death of Marat, and I exchanged Marat's dead body, the body of Tuyang Lantou, 
um, who was one of the um, fierce fighters and warriors in the Haitian Revolution, who was seldom so sort of could do within narratives of the revolution. She fought alongside this alien and was believed to have been enslaved alongside of him in Jamaica. And, and is believed to have been the one that she taught him to be as ruthless as he was. He's, he's remembered to be um, the sort of complete opposite of Toussaint Louverture, who was a statesman who spoke French, who kind of sought uh, and, and hoped for uh, to gain respect of the French. And Tessaline was the exact opposite um, and fought with uh, a kind of ruthless aggression that is credited for having won the revolution. Um, and the woman who taught him that was his aunt, uh, Toyama Tu. And so in my painting, Murat's body is gone and um, Toyama Tu's body replaces him. Uh, and instead of the French Gironde dagger, she's holding uh, uh, a machete, the sort of quintessential symbol of the Royal Revolution. And I think whenever I bring in the sort of art historical citation, it's less about, like that painting is less about Jacques-Louis David and more about collapsing these two historical moments. The Haitian Revolution began in 1791. The French Revolution began, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jacques-Louis David started or, or finished um, Death of Marat in 1793. And so thinking about what was happening in these two countries uh, almost simultaneously and trying to sort of recombine in my own historical imagination those two, those two historical moments in this new work that, that shapes a different sort of narrative. How do you explain that? So one of, uh, another bone of contention we had in our uh, pre- the event email chain was the idea of opacity, <laughs> right? And I want to read a, a somewhat long quote um, from Teju Cole. Um, he once described Edward Lassant's claim to opacity as, quote, a right to not to have to be understood on others' terms, a right to be misunderstood if need be. It was a stance against certain expectations of transparency embedded in the French language, he said. Lassant sought to defend the opacity, obscurity, and inscrutability of Caribbean blacks and other marginalized peoples. External pressures insisted on everything being eliminated, simplified, and explained. Lassant's response was no. And this gentle refusal, the suggestion that there is another way, a deeper way, holds true, I think, for both Gadi and William, right? For both of you. So if we think about your work and the ways in which it embraces that notion that everything doesn't have to be explained, I don't have, it doesn't have to be indexical, it doesn't, you know, we can't tick, this is Haitian, this is American, this is this, this is that. What, what do you think um, that allows for your work in relation to audiences? Or what kind of pressures? Does this right to not have everything just be, I don't know, um, just transparent and mm -hmm. accessible, to in a sense force or insist that audiences spend time with the work? Um, what does that say? That quote uh, does ring true, actually. Um, and I would just say that I didn't feel that the pre, that the emails had a bone of contention at all <laughs> um, <laughs> on this point. I think Paul actually uh, very much subscribes to this. Um, unfortunately, in the time that he was making these works, I think the consequence of saying no to this, you know, to um, simplification, um, or the call for simplifying, uh, was that audiences, or I should say, the, you know, the arbiters of, uh, or the gatekeepers, you know, who would show the work to audiences, often would simply choose not to show the work to audiences. The works are, are complex. Um, and frequently defy categorization. Um, and, you know, I think the fact of the matter, oftentimes more than not, um, 
particularly at a time in the art world where the discourse was not so interested in complexity or difficult conversation um, was that, you know, um, audiences weren't willing to do the work. Uh, gallerists were not interested in being provocative. They were not interested in having difficult conversations. So, um, and Paul was not really interested in um, in choosing. He was, he said, I am, don't, please don't put me in strictly a Haitian box. I, I don't make, you know, that is not the type of, of work. I don't make, um, you know, I don't make strictly sort of um, what, what formerly was offensively known as primitive art that is incredibly, um, you know, he found that term really offensive. Um, art naive, art primitive is terrible. Um, and we are in an age where that is thankfully long out of fashion, that term. Um, he, but he also, you know, was not a, a Western, you know, European artist. Um, he needed people to understand that uh, that these that these traditions needed to coexist side by side, um, and that you know the diaspora is real. Um, and in the same way that um, the French left behind um, creolized culture, that um, <laughs> that these blended. Um, traditions and that these blended uh, themes existed in art as well. Um, and basically he felt, I think, that it's not my problem if you, if the art world isn't ready and doesn't have a place for it. I'm an artist and this is what I need to make. And if you're not ready for it, that's your problem. <laughs> so, you know, but what is the consequence of that is that you know, I think it is essentially marginalization. So, by and large, he was an artist that kept to himself and made work for himself. And, um, you know, and because, and he produced because that's what he had to do. Um, you know, thankfully now we are in a time when artists have uh, more access, more opportunity, um, they have more um, outlets for self promotion. Um, and the world is more welcoming for, for voices of all kinds, for, um, for people of all backgrounds. Um, you know, and I think, um, but I think to that, ter to that quote, um, he, he absolutely would have, would have sided with, I choose, I choose that kind of, I choose that kind of opacity, it's not my job. To, to explain it to you. It's not my job. If it's not for you, then, you know, I, 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 I'm not here to teach. <laughs> the, the quote makes me um, think about one of my favorite writers um, who's, you know, not going to mention. <laughs> um, who I was reading one of uh, his most recent books, and in it, he there's a line where he's recounting this anecdote um, where something is translated to him. And in, and in that line, he says, translation is love. Translation is an act of love. Um, and I remember as much as I loved this book and as much as I loved him, I was like, well, that's BS. Um, and, and that's someone who hasn't had to translate public documents for their non-English speaking parents. That's someone who hasn't had to walk uh, in public spaces, not understanding the language that is printed on the walls that indicates points of egress and access. That's someone who hasn't had to go to a coffee shop and figure out what is said on the menu. Um, and so growing up in Miami as a six-year-old immigrant with a family of also non-English speaking speakers, I, I, it was very palpable to me that legibility depending on translation was an act of survival <clears throat> and then exercising that muscle in my coming of age I quickly began to realize that that was a labor that I didn't always want to be responsible for particularly as an artist 
Um, and so as I started to make work that played with language and that interrogated language, I wanted to think about what, how, how can I offset that labor onto my viewer? Um, rather than performing it myself, how can I think about how my viewer can then perform that labor of translation? And is mistranslation and illegibility just as much a part of representation as transparency? Um, and, and for me, the answer is an emphatic yes, because in that gap, in that, in that erasure, um, there's space for the viewer to project themselves into, into that arena. Now, that's a risk that I'm, I'm happy to take. Um, one of the things that I often talk about is I had a show many years ago where uh, all the titles of my paintings were in Haitian Creole, and I specifically asked the gallery not to provide any translations. Um, and the gallery was really, really worried about it, and a lot of times when the show was talked about or written up, it, they, was, they were always mistranslated, um, it, almost every time. <laughs> and I was, I was ready and, and um, completely sort of uh, open to that, because I think in that, in that space there's a lot of vulnerability for a viewer to project themselves into, um, in, into what that might mean, and, and um, into this question about opacity and what is the sort of exchange that should take place between an author um, uh, and a viewer, especially in a, a sort of contemporary moment where like, you know, self-expression uh, and monetized content are, are quite, dis, uh, you, it hard to distinguish the two from one another. And so this question of like legibility always being a sort of net positive is, is something that I think needs to be interrogated, particularly in narratives around artists who were talking about immigration, identity, and home and belonging. Um, so, you know, Blissant is the prime example of this, but I think expression of opacity is something that um, it, it, in, in the contemporary art space should be interrogated quite vigorously. Thank you. I, I'm getting the prompt from the code to one of the things that I'm going to open it up for conversation. And I just want to I just want to mention that downstairs is there are two beautiful artist books that we haven't gotten a chance to talk about yet. But please pay attention when you go downstairs to um, to see the show. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about it or no, that's okay. <laughs> and, and, um, and Didier also has an artist book. Uh, of sketches uh, downstairs. It's quite beautiful, and I just want to um, point out to you uh, to take special note of those two things when you go down to see the show. And without any further ado, we'd like to open up the floor to any questions that you may have. Are there any questions? I'll, I'll actually have two questions, um, uh, uh, and they're completely different. Um, so the first is uh, just coming off of the last series of comments by DDA, thinking about the um, the the the, um, the, the uh, leaving of the labels in, in Haitian Creole. It, it occurred to me that it's not just about mistranslation in, in that space, but also about inverting belonging, because uh, you know the expectation is that you go into a gallery and. The communities that you know, for which this immediately is legible as a you know English speaking community, but I can imagine a viewer going in there surrounded by a language that is suddenly legible as well. So it, it, that that to me just strikes it, it strikes me that that's another beautiful way of just kind of inverting that experience of, of belonging um, within the gallery space. So I was wondering you might want to talk a little bit more about that because yeah. that also is about basically making the gallery home um, for another, yeah, for an for, uh, um, inherently mobile and migrant community. Um, so that's one question. The other question has to be the scale and the scale of these works, because that's one of the things that is so striking about the, the works in the gallery is, is just the um, all-encompassing feeling of them because they are so, so large. So. I'm actually really uh, glad you said that because um, the first, the very first time I titled something in Creole was actually a show in Miami, um, 
and it was previous to this other show I mentioned, and my mom, my dad, my aunt, and a friend of theirs came to the show, and I had one painting in that show that was titled The Creole, and the four of them sort of made a beeline to that painting and kind of stood there the whole night and, and spoke Creole to each other and laughed and forgot that they were at, even at a show, um, and I kept having to like, nudge them and tell them to behave. Um, and I, I witnessed exactly what you just beautifully described, that it, it created this sort of insular um, a pocket of space that was just theirs. Um, it, it reconfigured the exhibition space into something that belonged to them. And I wanted to take that moment and extend it out to the entire exhibition. I wanted, instead of having them, forcing them to have to sort of um, uh, br bridge that gap for themselves, I wanted to make that, I wanted to center that experience for the entire exhibition. Um, and so I, I love that you made that point <coughs> and allowed me to elaborate. And then the second question that you mentioned, scale. The way I think about scale is it actually has less to do with the actual dimensions of the work and more to do with the fact that I, want, I work figuratively um, and I want the body to be larger than life size. I want the body to be just outside of uh, conventional scale. And so oftentimes I'll say, you know, if the bodies of my paintings could stand up straight, I want them to be about seven or eight feet tall. Once I come up with the composition, I let that determine how big the painting needs to be. Sometimes that's 50 by 40, 55 by 72, and other times that's um, 106 by 70 inches. Um, that's what really determines the scale at which the paintings operate, um, is that sort of one-to-one -one relationship between the bodies in the painting and your body in the space in real time. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll just say that Especially with Paul's work, I love the incorporation of glitter and something you would think of such like an unconventional like fine art material. Do you um, consider Paul's work and even Didier like do the materials come first when you're thinking about like the ideas of home and immigration, and do you have to like defend those material uses? <laughs> Um, so the glitter question comes up often, actually. Um, and in Paul's case, I mean, more and more, uh, you know, artists are, are using all kinds of materials. Uh, so we're seeing glitter more often than, than I think we used to. Um, but in Paul's case, the glitter actually is a nod to the sequins that are used um, by Haitian artists to make voodoo flags, which are known as trapo. Um, so, uh, and in particular, uh, a way to invoke and bring in uh, elements of reflectivity into the work, um, which is, uh, which harkens back to um, themes of uh, African, um, African art aesthetics um, and, and Congo spirituality, which, in which um, reflectivity is thought to bring, attract the attention of spirits. Um, so, which is essentially the, the, the philosophy behind the voodoo flags as well. Um, but Paul was not a, a tailor, or he was not about to sew sequins into his paintings, or do textile work, so glitter was the solution. Um, but many, many, many of his works have this glitter element, so um, that, that's really the, the ethos behind, behind that. Um, but for for him, um, you know, throughout the course of, of his career, he used all kinds of materials. He, you know, like obviously, like we showed, the, the soil, rope, um, plaster, uh, staples, hardware, uh, glass. With very few things kind of were were off limits. Um, it, you know, and but all of them typically had a all everything had conceptual meaning behind it. Um, so nothing, nothing was unintentional in, in that regard. Um, that, yeah, that's really, that's really the answer there. Um, I mean, I, I think I, I, if I understand the question, I think about it in two ways. 
I think for me, um, material is where alchemy meets research. Um, and by that I mean, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about the surface of the painting. Not composition, not drawing, not even color really, but the actual like one one sixteenth relief sitting on the surface of the object. Um, and how to get that very, very incredibly shallow amount of space to open up. Um, through what uh, material processes can I turn that very shallow amount of space into something quite expansive. And so that, I think, is what clued me into the idea that, oh, carving into the surface of this birch panel actually gives my viewer a very, very shallow depth that they could observe distance in real time. Um, so shallow and so potent that it doesn't replicate at JPEGs and you can only see it in real time. Uh, and so it, it reinforced the sort of present space of, of the painting. That was a process that took me many, many years after graduate school of you know not showing work and not um, having exhibitions and anything like that and just locked up in my tiny Brooklyn apartment making really bad paintings that nobody ever saw and will see. Um, and those paintings kind of taught me about what those services needed to do. Um, and, and, and that also was part of my printmaking practice. At the time, I was um, teaching printmaking at Vassar College um, for a good seven years. And so I would take a lot of those experiences that I was having with my students and then bring them back to my studio in Brooklyn and then exercise them in, in painting form. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was really building this surface, this kind of polymedial interdisciplinary surface between painting and printmaking that would then become the surfaces of my paintings. Um, in some ways super traditional, but in, in some ways also um, quite unconventional because it becomes quite sequential and uh, the steps that have to be followed are really specific, kind of like cooking. Um, and so that is the kind of material way in which I experience painting. To the second, um, to the second part of the question, like have I ever felt like I needed to defend them? No. <laughs> um, I think much like cooking, if it tastes good, you don't have to defend it. Um, and so the task just becomes like you making sure that you put in the work to figure out how these things come together, right? I work both with paint or uh, with acrylic and oil. And sequentially, that's a very specific process that has to take place in order to protect the integrity of the surface, in order to make sure it's light fast, in order to make sure the thing doesn't fall apart, uh, all that kind of stuff. And it just takes time to, to figure that out and see what, what works best. There were some paintings that preceded the ones in the show that you know I have and that are falling apart <laughs> that were not well put together um, back, back in the day. And I, I think that's just the process of figuring out what kind of time your work requires. conversation with um, artists um, in Haiti in terms of where they're at in the practice. Um, I guess you start to say where I got first into like artists from uh, Haitian practices, living like um, political resistance. Mm -hmm. So what do you see like your works or your father's works in relation to what's going on in the country? Um, and sort of the lineage mm -hmm. right, this historical practice. That's a hard question. Um, and I don't know that I think about it that often. Uh, I think, like I said, I moved here when I was six, when we moved, my family moved here when I was six years old. Um, and I think I very quickly realized that the place I thought was home, uh, we wouldn't be going back to, and I would have to figure out a new relationship to home. Um, and then I subsequently realized, oh, this place is also uh, complex in its idea of home for black people. Um, and as I have sort of come into my voice as an artist, I've started to think a little bit less about how my work relates to 
artists working in AV and more about how my work related, relates to Haitian artists working in the global sort of diaspora. Jean Marie Tessier was an Asian artist living in, in Berlin whose work I love and who I've developed a really um, great friendship with. He and I have conversations quite often. Uh, Nugent Smith, who's based here in New Jersey, uh, I think he's based in Newark, um, and makes work about the um, kind of geographical and topographical uh, arrangements that have led to Caribbean ness and Caribbean identity. Philly Baez, painter based in New York. Um, I, I mean, there's a number of people who were sort of stratified throughout the globe who were thinking kind of globally about um, this question of um, identifying with a sort of homeland, right? Especially when the notions of what land belongs to who are in constant question, not just in Haiti, but around the world. Um, and, and there's been some brilliant exhibitions thinking through that exact idea um, and thinking through how Caribbean artists broadly, Asian artists specifically, identify with a certain kind of home space and what are the signs, symbols, and signals that give way to this notion of home that we rely so much on to identify belonging and to identify origin. But what happens in the scenarios where one is disabused of that privilege and you have to figure out a different way to subsist and survive? Um, what happens to this sort of privileged origin story that we cling to uh, so heavily and so deeply uh, in order to identify ourselves when that's specifically and deliberately stripped from you? Um, and I, either through movement or through uh, political action. And so I, I try to deprivilege that as much as possible in the studio. Now, going back to, I think, the, one of the questions Erica started us with, I think now as a dad, I'm thinking differently about those questions and thinking about my, my children having a different sort of ancestral relationship to the land and to the ground. Um, but you know, I think your question is a good one, and it's it's I see it more of a question for people like Nicole and our historians uh, and Erica, um, who, who who get to sort of build that archive in terms of like how do we reshape these archives to specifically be privileged these notions of identity so that uh, artists have the sort of agency to tell our stories uh, with a little bit more integrity. I'll field this uh, briefly, um, although I've tempted not to, because that was a lovely way to end. Um, Paul did actually see himself in relation to the Haitian lineage of painters, and I, I, I think I, I, I know that only because of a self-portrait that was created, um, entitled Self-Portrait with Hector Ippolit, <laughs> um, in which he actually appropriated the work um, from the Haitian master um, and gave it a treatment um, typical of Paul's, you know, very contemporary style. Um, and you know, there weren't he didn't do many self portraits, um, but depicted himself as a, you know, as a. Paul was a, a lighter-skinned man who depicted himself as a dark-skinned person with a with a white mask, with a black and white mask on, um, and so it. Um, but you know, so it, it takes this sort of uh, traditional painting um, and juxtaposes Paul's body against it, um, but again with all, but also with some signifiers. Of, you know, Alluding allusions uh, to Basquiat, it, it, it places Paul in this lineage of kind of Haitian contemporary painters. Um, it basically is it's an homage, you know, to to the entire lineage of uh, you know an evolution, a kind of a Haitian art, um, and you know it similar to how many of Paul's works are, not necessarily the two that are on view downstairs, um, but there are sort of vignettes and many juxtapositions, frames within frames. Um, but it, undoubtedly, you know, he he understood and saw that there, there really is no, um, one cannot necessarily be um, and operate really as a, a painter knowledgeable about um, the Haitian lineage of painting without kind of honoring your forebearers in this way. 
Um, you know, he was a painter who appropriated a lot of work um, in many ways. You know, he often appropriated art from European masters, um, you know, European painters in a highly critical way. When he did appropriate Haitian artists, it was in a, a way uh, strictly as an homage. Um, so uh, he was certainly aware, though, of the lineage. Um, and I, you know, it was, it, <laughs> it's up for debate, though, how exactly he placed himself within it, because a lot of those works are very tongue-in-cheek as well. So, um, but maybe one day we'll, we'll have it on, on exhibit and you can judge for yourself. Okay. Thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. Giving each other a hand. And I